Hey, mister, what did you do in the war? Did you shoot down your brothers in a hail of gunfire? Did you pray with your musket and the brush and the briar? Did you scream from the bloodshed that never tired? Hey, mister, what was it all for? It was a crazy, 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 crazy war. When the last shell burst over Fort Sumter, the harsh reality of a civil war confronted a divided American Republic mired in dispute. A growing nation still in its infancy braced for war and an uncertain future. The stark differences separating the northern and southern states ignited a conflict so devastating that nearly every family mourned a loved one. For the next four years, two amateur armies mauled each other leaving America's landscape awash in the blood of her finest young men. In 1861, all the heated rhetoric over slavery, bellowing from fiery politicians, faded as the drumbeat for war grew louder in a fractured nation moving closer to ruin. Feudal attempts at compromise spanning decades demanded that the matter be immediately shifted from the legislative halls to the field of battle for a resolution. War fever infected the country, sweeping through every town and hamlet into the farthest reaches of America. Recruiting halls overflowed with eager young men from all walks of life, willing to lay down the tools of their trade and pick up a musket to fight for a cause. Idealistic volunteers infused with patriotic fervor signed on for a crusade, never suspecting the magnitude of the severe trials that awaited. Thoughts of glory and adventure overshadowed the grim realities of warfare. Newly crowned civilian soldiers bid farewell to friends, kissed their families goodbye, marched off to war, and many simply vanished, never to be seen or heard from again. A call to arms was answered in force. Factories in both sectors of America ramped up production of muskets, swords, and cannon, all for the express purpose of killing each other. But with all the hasty preparations for waging war, neither side gave much thought to capturing and holding large numbers of prisoners. A prevailing belief of a short war dismissed any long-term plans for confinement. As a result, thousands of captured soldiers suffered dearly for the lack of foresight on the part of generals, whose primary focus was victory on the battlefield. For the captured soldier, another, more deadly war was about to begin. Food, water, and shelter often proved to be luxuries in many of the camps. Any soldier captured now faced his toughest battle of the war against the unrelenting adversaries of starvation, exposure, and disease. A soldier's odds of surviving battle far surpassed his chances of walking out of prison alive. Musket balls and artillery shells pose much less danger than a Civil War prison. Loyal young men who freely volunteered when their respective nations called now realized that their leaders had abandoned them in captivity. No help was on the way. Left to die, soldiers on both sides cursed the governments they swore to uphold. Earnest negotiations to resume the exchange never took place after Grant assumed overall command in March of 1864. Any negotiating was purely theatrical for the families back home, clamoring for an exchange of captured loved ones. Eventually, the underlying reason for the failure to exchange prisoners emerged when the North recognized their huge advantage in manpower. A war of attrition favored the North. The North had a deeper well of citizens to replace their captured soldiers. In the South, the pool for potential soldiers was running dry. A fixed plan in the North determined that rebel prisoners remain captive and not be returned to southern soil until the conclusion of the war. By neglecting to renew the exchange, the belligerent nations set the stage for one of the greatest tragedies in American history. 
Any hope of rescue gave way to despair for prisoners, wallowing in deplorable conditions that only worsened as the war dragged on. Exchange was dead. Angry rebel prisoners up north resented Richmond placing more value on their blacks than on their own soldiers. In the north, Grant, Stanton, and the Lincoln administration concluded that their soldiers in prison down south were expendable. If they had to languish and die in prison for a perceived advantage in numbers, so be it. Little consideration or worth was given to soldiers no longer under arms and unable to fight. These cruel policies valuing ideology over humanity condemned thousands of innocent and helpless prisoners to an early grave. Chief of Staff, Union General Henry Halleck stated, To exchange their healthy men for ours who are on the brink of the grave from their hellish treatment, of course, gives them the advantage. The advantages in warfare always reigned supreme for generals plotting strategy. The plight of the prisoners gained little sympathy among the military elite. Grant, noting the ill health of northern prisoners, took a similar view as Halleck in a letter to Stanton when he wrote, Exchange simply reinforces the enemy at once, while we get no benefit from the soldiers we receive for three months and lose the majority entirely. No longer of any benefit to the army, volunteers who came running when Father Abraham called now felt discarded. Concern for prisoners differed little in the South. The war had a devastating effect on the South's ability to feed their own people. Major cities down South continually dealt with food riots involving frustrated citizens. Although lacking resources, a heartless attitude was evident. When Richmond was advised of food shortages plaguing Union prisoners in Southern camps, an indifferent Commissary General Lucius Northrop declared, It is just that those who cause the scarcity be the first to suffer from it and the suffering ensued in spades. Prison populations exploded in 1864, well beyond the capacity to care for them. The spring campaigns brought thousands more into already crowded prisons. A South depleted of supplies had little food, clothing, or medicine for sick and hungry prisoners in torn and tattered clothes. Yet they held them anyway despite the recognized rules of war which state that if you can't provide the basic necessities of life for your captives, you are obliged to release them. Unable to provide the essentials to sustain life, the Confederate High Command stood by oblivious to the surging death toll. In Washington, officials believed the mistreatment of Union prisoners was intentional, so Stanton ordered retaliation against Confederate prisoners by withholding food, clothing, and medicine from soldiers held in areas of the country overflowing with ample provisions. Shirking their own responsibility, the North intentionally inflicted unnecessary misery and death among Southern prisoners. A perverted strategy demanded the Confederate prisoners remain captive till victory was secured, while ignoring their own rapidly dying Union men held down South. An indifferent South coupled with a vindictive North brought untold suffering to prisoners waiting for diplomatic efforts to bring them home. Devoted young soldiers, North and South, whose only offense was volunteering to support their nation of choice, yearned for home and began doubting if they would ever see their families again. The year 1864 was especially severe as prisoners surrendered life in alarming numbers to starvation and diseases so indiscriminately racing through all the prisons. Soldiers strong and vibrant before capture slowly wasted away under intolerably harsh conditions. For prisoners racked with debilitating disease, whose demise was certain, death seemed an act of mercy. Wagons carried the dead away in droves. A steady procession of emaciated cadavers to the burial pits challenged grave diggers to keep pace with a soaring mortality. The dark underbelly of the Civil War was emerging with little fanfare in Washington or Richmond. An agreement for exchanging prisoners proved elusive until the final months of the war when the issue was all but decided. For countless boys already decaying in the trenches, it came too late. 
The tremendous loss of life in Civil War prisons remains to this day a sad and controversial chapter of the war. From the 420,000 soldiers held captive during the war, starvation and neglect killed 30,000 Yankees and 26,000 Confederate soldiers. Most historians believe the agreed-upon figure of 56,000 prison dead to be grossly underreported. The official number excludes those barely clinging to life who expired in hospital shortly after release from prison. Also absent from the list of prison dead are the prisoners whose lifeless bodies emerged by the hundreds from the hospital ships and rail cars before ever reaching home. They died free men, but an inhumane prison sealed their fate and many laid their bones in community churchyards and local cemeteries only weeks or months after arriving home. An accurate number of soldiers who perished as a direct result of their prison experience is unknown and probably staggering. Amid the furious battles raging in the spring of 1864, thousands of newly captured soldiers from both armies surrendered their freedom and marched at the point of a bayonet to the rear of the enemy lines. After a long journey into the northern or southern heartland, prisoners entered already congested prisons unable to handle a new influx of prisoners. More prisoners required immediate action for new prisons. In the north, it was decided that another Union training facility in Elmira, New York, could be altered into a prison to accommodate the excess of Confederate captives. The choice for the South, a new stockade cut from a pine forest in southwest Georgia near the small hamlet of Anderson, accepted the bulk of the Union prisoners. Both Elmira Prison and the Andersonville Stockade would be remembered as appalling death camps, known for their deprivations and flagrant loss of life. The Elmira Military Prison undoubtedly ranks as the absolute worst prison in the North. Frequently compared to Andersonville, it was considerably smaller but still registered a deplorable 25% death rate in less than a year. When the camp opened in July 1864, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton had already set in motion his vindictive policy of retaliating against the Southern prisoners for the perceived mistreatment of Union prisoners in the Southern camps. By cutting rations to meager portions, delaying medicines, and withholding clothing, the dying among the Southerners accelerated not only at Elmira, but in all the Northern prisons. In total accord with Stanton was Commissary General of Prisoners, Colonel William Hoffman, who earlier gave the following directive to his commandants. So long as a prisoner has clothes on his back, no matter how torn or ragged, you will issue him nothing. After the war, the frugal Hoffman returned a total of $1.8 million to the War Department in unused funds initially allocated for the care of Confederate prisoners. Like all the prisons, North and South, Elmira lacked a sustainable diet, forcing prisoners to supplement their reduced rations by hunting and capturing the abundance of rats that inhabited all the polluted prisons. Prisoners later wrote in numerous diaries that it was a satisfying day when they enjoyed a warm helping of rat stew. Prisoner F.S. Wade went so far as to declare, a broiled rat was superb. I got up in my bunk with a bone and after gnawing at the soft end, I sucked at the bone for hours at a time. Prisoner John King, Elmira Prison. Carpenters at Elmira worked feverishly constructing wooden boxes trying to keep up with the large number of Confederates who forfeited life needlessly in a land with ample provisions. From a prison population of 10,000, nearly 3,000 identified and neatly arranged stones marked the final resting place of deceased prisoners in Woodlawn Cemetery. In charge of managing the cemetery was a black man and runaway slave, John Jones, who buried the defenders of slavery with the care and dignity he believed all people deserved. Nothing remains of Elmira Prison but the well-kept Confederate section of Woodlawn Cemetery along with its Confederate memorial. The beauty and orderly grounds reflect the compassion of a caretaker who saw only young men robbed of life so early. In the same cemetery, John Jones rests in peace not far from the Southerners for whom he bestowed the utmost respect in death.
Marching from the train depot along an old wagon trail, hundreds of Yankee prisoners entered a brand new stockade in Georgia, feeling fortunate at being transferred from the deprivations on Bell Island. Any feeling of good fortune soon vanished. One of every three prisoners entering the Andersonville Military Prison never saw home again, but instead claimed space in the burial grounds that eventually exceeded the overall acreage of the prison itself. Stepping off the trains, they never imagined their new home was destined to be recorded in the annals of history as a stain on American decency and one of the saddest tragedies ever perpetuated on American soil. Soldiers were herded like farm animals into a barren 26-acre stockade with no shade. Upon entering the corral, Confederates issued no shelter for protection from the rain or the hot Georgia sun, no soap for washing, and no utensils for cooking. The small stream running through the camp, serving as both their toilet and drinking water, proved wholly inadequate for the sustenance of life. Excessive numbers of men without adequate latrines or means for defecating transformed Andersonville into a large cesspool, creating a stench that drifted on the air for miles around. Under the command of General John Winder, the population rose to an astounding 33,000 prisoners until Sherman's advance on Atlanta in September of 1864 forced most able prisoners to be relocated to other prisons. From that point on, Andersonville mostly served as a hospital for the critically sick prisoners unable to travel. In the stockade's 14-month existence, 13,000 Union soldiers took their last breath, but over 10,000 died in only five months over the wretched summer of 1864. Starvation, disease, and exposure killed 100 men per day during the month of August in the grossly overcrowded prison. When the wagons carried the skeletal remains to the cemetery, the burial details laid the naked and deceased prisoners in the trenches shoulder to shoulder without any coffins, leaving today's stone markers only inches apart. One of the last remaining soldiers to leave Andersonville on April 17, 1865, Corporal William Ziegler, later recalled the heart-wrenching scene. Finally, the few that were left were ordered out. I looked back, and not one living soul remained in the enclosure. The empty prison and the standing stockade seemed like some grim monster, grinning with hatred because it had not taken the lives of the few who were left. As I stood outside the gate, I couldn't repress the tears as they ran down my hollow cheeks. I thought of the mothers, wives, and sisters in some far-off northern home, praying and awaiting the return of their loved one, but their bodies were moldering into dust. At the turn of the 19th century, individual states began honoring their fallen soldiers at Andersonville. In the cemetery, as well as the stockade area, striking monuments pay tribute to those who suffered and died alone in a faraway land. The peace and serenity that permeate the pine forest of today bear little resemblance to the horrific scenes that defiled the same ground so many years ago. No piece of land in American history saw more death and misery than the deadly grounds at Andersonville Prison. After four years of bloody warfare, the end of the traumatic war between the states seemed certain when Richmond finally fell to Union forces early in April 1865. An elated President Lincoln walked through the streets of the captured Southern Capitol on April 4th, knowing the curtain was finally falling on the Confederacy. Soldiers north and south cheered the end of a long and gruesome war that went on far longer than anyone predicted. But none welcomed the merciful end more than the thousands of ailing prisoners in the squalid prison camps. The prison gates swung open allowing those capable of walking to march to the train depots for the long journey home. Frail prisoners close to death and too weak to travel remained behind in nearby hospitals. For them, dreams of home went unfulfilled. Prisoners boarded congested trains and covered the decks of steamboats waiting to transport them to loved ones and life after war. Men cheered, some laughed, others cried uncontrollably, and those still able to dance carried on in delight at their coming reunion with family. Not all realized their hope of a blissful reunion. 
Rail cars and hospital ships carrying severely afflicted prisoners unloaded lifeless bodies at various stops along the way of men who came so close to home but lost their struggle en route. In Richmond, nurse Phoebe Pember expressed shock and horror after witnessing prisoners passing through the capital city in a frightful condition and wondered how civilized people and humanity ever allowed such a travesty to befall fellow human beings. Can any pen or pencil do justice to those squalid pictures of famine and desolation, to those gaunt, lank skeletons with the dried yellow flesh? Living and dead were taken from the flag of truce boat, not distinguishable save from the difference of care in moving them. When we review the past, it would seem that Christianity was but a name, that the atonement had failed and Christ had lived and died in vain. For returning prisoners of war so racked with disease, the dying continued unabated in the months and years after gaining their freedom. Although the echo of gunfire fell silent and the killing on the battlefields halted, a fight to regain any semblance of health was lost for gravely ill soldiers whose constitution declined well beyond recovery. For many, the fight ended quickly. Barely recognizable to family and friends at their homecoming, they promptly died. The immense joy families felt at welcoming home a returning loved one soon dissolved into anguish as the number of widows of former prisoners continued to grow in the post-war years. Orphan children of deceased prisoners joined the fatherless children of battle casualties at the many needed orphanages built after the war. Sick prisoners who quickly died after the war fall outside the parameters of the official war statistics and thus aren't included on the death roll of 56,000 prison dead. A precise number of men whose death may be a direct result of a foul Civil War prison will never be known. Seeking justice for death on such a massive scale, the North rounded up those responsible. Captain Henry Wurz, the Commandant at Andersonville, was tried and hung for his part. The only other Commandant put on trial, Major John G., prison keeper of Salisbury Prison, was found innocent. The most despised man in the North, Jefferson Davis, spent two years as a prisoner in Fortress Monroe before feelings softened and he was released without ever being charged. Not a single Northern official faced scrutiny for the retaliation and malicious conduct that transpired in Union camps where equally large numbers of Confederates died in a land of abundance. All the brave young Americans who answered their country's call whether North or South, are all dead and gone now. Their impact on the course of American history lives on. Peach orchards, apple orchards, and bucolic farmlands that once staged bloody battles now stand as living monuments to the gallant participants who sacrificed all for a cause. Splendid bronze statues grace the rolling hills and meadows of the present-day battlefields to honor the heroic efforts of an individual or to mark the spot where a famed regiment made a glorious charge. Beautiful monuments in numerous cemeteries commemorate the prison dead who gave all for their country, but are seldom visited and draw much less attention from the throngs of tourists that visit the famous fields of battle. These noble soldiers are no less a hero than those soldiers who died on the battlefield. Just as regiments reunited in the post-war years for reunions, ex-prisoners of war sharing a common bond gathered to remember comrades who lost their lives in prison. In 1907, at the dedication of the Connecticut Monument at Andersonville, a former prisoner stood in front of the crying boy figure and spoke eloquently in a stirring tribute to those prisoners of war who died in captivity. Sergeant Robert Kellogg rose up before the gathering of aging vets and remembered those who died a long way from the theater of war with little salutation or reverence. He bemoaned the unassuming manner in which so many equally patriotic men died in obscurity in a cramped and filthy prison rather than falling on the battlefield. With words that may have pertained to the many brave American prisoners who surrendered their lives in all wars, past or present, he told the crowd, It was not in the heat of battle that these men gave up their life. 
No cheer of victory roused them as their souls took flight. But in the loneliness of a multitude, with only a comrade by their side, within an enemy's line under a hostile flag, these sons passed to their great reward.